All right, everyone. Uh, I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Of course, we've got audiences all over the world. We welcome you all to the International Hydrofoil Society. My name is Ray Valenga. I'm the president. And today we will be having two presentations. Bill Hochberger will be your presenter. He's had 30 years in the International Hydrofoil Society. He's a professional naval architect. He's been a board member for 16 years. It's been a while since he's been a board member, but he served way back in the old days. He's also uh, the head of uh, Tsunami, which is the Society for Naval and Maritime, or excuse me, Marine Engineers and also SD5, another organization that he heads. These sessions are recorded and they can be seen next week as soon as we process them and post them on YouTube. The way to find them is to go on YouTube and look for our channel, which is called Hydrofoil. You might also find it by, uh, when you get on YouTube, try to find International Hydrofoil Society too. But there you'll find 31 videos that we have recorded during our 50th year celebration. Our anniversary is uh, started in uh, 1975, let's see, 50 years ago. Yeah, I'd have to do the math on that. But um, we've been around for a while. The last big celebration was 25 years ago. So we're back again celebrating. And uh, at this time, I introduce Bill Hockberger. Bill, take it away. Thanks very much, Ray. Our first speaker today is Tom Spear, who was mainly an aviation flight test engineer and aerodynamicist in his career, but evolved over time into a hydrodynamicist as well. In fact, the title of his presentation today is Aero Hydrodynamic Design and Racing of the Class at 34th America's Cup. His presentation runs about 70 minutes, which is of course too long to accommodate fully here today, but Tom is going to show a selection from it to make sure we're all with him as he speaks. Tom designed his first hydrofoil in high school and continued with them in college, but then had to put them aside to pursue a career. He graduated in 1975 from Iowa State University in aerospace engineering and was commissioned into the US Air Force where he conducted wind tunnel tests, created flight control system simulations, and did research on a number of advanced aircraft developments. He graduated from the Air Force Test Pilot School's Flight Test Engineer course and completed a master's degree in aeronautical engineer while in the Air Force. And along the way, he took up land sailing on the Mojave Desert and with some friends built an experimental land yacht with a rigid wing sail, which proved useful experience later on, as we'll hear. After retiring from the Air Force in 1996, Tom worked as a flight controls engineer for Boeing on studies for manned and unmanned aircraft, and also led the design of the control laws of the KC-767 aerial refueling boom control system. At Boeing, he rekindled his personal interest in hydrofoils and worked on several significant hydrofoil projects on the side. While there, he was engaged by the BMW Oracle racing design team as a consultant on their yacht for the 33rd America's Cup match. And that was a 90 foot long by 90 foot wide trimaran we heard Paul Beaker talk about and describe a couple of weeks ago. Tom designed the cross sections for the giant mast and rigid wing sail, making use of that, wing, that land sailing wing sail experience he got. Tom retired from Boeing after that to work full-time for Oracle Racing on the 34th America's Cup on the wing sail design for the AC-72 catamarans. And he subsequently assisted in the design of the hydrofoils for the AC-50 catamarans that were raced in Bermuda for his third America's Cup campaign. Tom still does some consulting on hydrofoil Uh, so uh, congratulations to the International Hydrofoil Society on your 50th anniversary. Uh, there aren't very many organizations that managed to uh, stick around for that long and 
uh, hopefully uh, we'll be coming back again for the 75th anniversary. So uh, as Bill mentioned, I'm going to kind of flip through a few of my slides today, uh, mainly concentrating on the hydrofoil aspects. For my presentation in general, what I wanted to do is put the hydrofoil design in, in, in context of the rest of the boat because you really have to design any hydrofoil craft and especially a sailboat as a complete system. You can't just scab hydrofoils onto something and expect it to be a success. So, uh, so that's why I go into quite a bit on the wing sail design and, and performance equations. But for this presentation, I'm going to, uh, like I say, just concentrate on the, the hydrofoils and maybe some of the history of the 34th America's Cup match. This picture shows 130 years of sailing technology in one shot. Uh, the schooner is a modern reproduction of the yacht America, which won the America's Cup in 1851. And that is now the oldest trophy in all of international sports. The boat on the left with the wing sail is the trimaran that Bill mentioned that ultimately won the America's Cup in 2010. And it was the sort of the forerunner of the, the boats that we then used in the uh, 34th America's Cup in Valencia, Spain. So I'm gonna flip through the wing sails here real briefly. Um, and go right to the hydrofoils. So the hydrofoils, as probably most of the uh, uh, audience for this talk knows, are basically wings that operate in water instead of in the air. But in all other respects, they're very much like aircraft wings. They come in various forms. Uh, uh, some are the, like the L foils that I've circled in these pictures or the T foil that was used on the stern. So the various, hydrofoil types, you can sort of classify by their rondeur or the shape of the foil in the transverse plane. The simplest ones are just straight hydrofoils and all sailboats have uh, really a hydrofoil of some kind, either the keel or a centerboard or daggerboard because they need to resist the side force from the sail rig. But if you can't that straight board, then you get a vertical component to the lift. And so many hydrofoils are using uh, canted boards uh, to provide some measure of, of vertical support, uh, but perhaps not supporting the boat all the way. Next is the sea foil, which uh, it can, compared to the, the um, canted foil, can basically change the ratio of horizontal to vertical lift simply by pushing the foil deeper into the water. So the deeper it is, the more horizontal component of the foil there is, and the more vertical the, the net lift is. The J foil is kind of a development of the C, which just has uh, even more uh, horizontal part and more vertical lift. So typically, uh, J foils and on are used for boats that are actually fully flying hydrofoils that get the hull completely out of the water. Now the S foil is kind of a variation on the J in that the top of the foil is recurved. And this results in a change in the cant angle as the, the foil is, it, depending on where it is, up and down in the trunk. And this is a way of, of changing the cant angle if for reasons of mechanical complexity or design rules, you're not allowed to change the cant uh, by itself. And then the L foil is what you saw in the previous picture. It basically has a vertical component and a horizontal component to sort of separate the vertical and horizontal lift production. Now, when you add dihedral to the L foil, now you, as I'll talk to a bit more later, you can start to get some coupling between the, the horizontal and the vertical in a way that stabilizes the boat. And then finally, there's the T-foil, which is uh, 
just as it sounds, you have a central strut and a wing on the bottom. And the advantage of the T-foil is you don't have the bending moments acting at the junction that you do with the L-foil. So it's structurally, it's a more balanced configuration. So why hydrofoils? Well, for a high performance boat, reducing drag is what's most important. And most of the drag sources increase with velocity. Skin friction goes up approximately by the square of the velocity. But the induced drag due to the dynamic lift on the hydrofoils actually decreases with speed. So as you go faster, what makes sense is to use dynamic lift to raise the boat out of the water. This reduces the wetted area of the hull and reduces that skin friction drag at the expense of adding the induced drag from the lift. Now at low speed, this doesn't make sense because the induced drag is so high that you end up with more total drag even though you reduce the wetted area. But at high speed, when the induced drag is actually decreasing, now it, the payoff does make sense. So there is some speed and it's dependent on the particulars of the design above which it makes more sense to fly and below which it makes more sense to float. And that's known as the crossover speed. And then the other aspect with the hydrofoils is stability. So in the vertical plane, you have, you're concerned with both the, the pitch angle of the boat and the, the heave displacement, how much vertical uh, motion it has. And this is uh, affected by the cant of the hydrofoils and controlled by the rake on this particular boat, which rakes the, the entire L-foil back and forth to change the angle of attack of the wing at the bottom. But there's a trade-off here in terms of, of performance in that generally the more stability you build into the boat, th there's a drag penalty that's associated with that. And so the boat is easier to fly and uh, and the, the easier for the crew to achieve good performance, but it may not be as, as fast. And so you reduce the stability, you can go faster, but it also requires much more skill on the part of the crew in order to actually realize that performance from the boat. So here's some examples of boats flying on foils. This is the AC-72 that Oracle Team USA used to win the America's Cup in San Francisco in 2013. Now I mentioned that the, the hedral angle of the L-foil uh, can be exploited in order to stabilize the boat in the vertical direction. When, when the AC-72 rule first came out, we didn't believe that it was possible to actually fly the boat on hydrofoils because the design rule didn't allow any mechanism for, uh, for controlling the boat. And if you don't have some sort of either artificial or natural stability, the boat can just simply fly up until it flies out of the water and then crashes back down. But New Zealand was the first ones to discover that there was a way to actually uh, implement this within the design rule. And then Oracle Team USA had to rediscover it for themselves uh, once uh, New Zealand had started experiment with foiling. And the way it works is a recognition that even an L foil is actually a surface piercing foil because it has to create a side force as well as a vertical force. So what happens is when you're sailing, the aerodynamic force on the sails is mostly to the side but somewhat forward. And it's that forward component that drives the boat. But the hydrofoils have to resist that sideways component. And they do that uh, by creating, uh, sliding sideways, uh, basically creating the leeway angle that is the, the uh, angle of attack of the foil in the, in the horizontal plane. So the more leeway there is, the higher the side force will be at a given speed. 
and the boat will basically find the leeway angle that just produces enough side force to oppose the aerodynamic force. Now, when the amount of foil that's immersed in the water changes, then the leeway angle has to change. So when the boat flies higher, there's less immersed area. And that means that there has to be a higher leeway angle in order to get the same side force to oppose the aerodynamic force. And when that leeway angle increases, it acts on the, the horizontal wing of the foil in order to reduce the force, uh, depending on what that uh, dihedral angle is of the foil. So the, the more that wing is angled up, then the more the water seems to strike it from the top as the leeway angle increases and the less lift there will be on that foil. So this coupling provides a natural feedback mechanism where when the boat flies higher, the leeway angle increases increased leeway decreases the lift on the wing, which brings the boat back down. And that's how the AC-72s and the AC-50s are stabilized in flight uh, and, and made foiling possible in the 34th America's Cup. But you also notice that that vertical force on the wing is inclined to leeward and so the more dihedral you use, the more leeward component it is, and even more side force has to be created by the vertical part of the foil in order to overcome that. And that means more drag on the foil. So this is where the trade-off comes between stability and performance. So let me give you a little history of the 34th match of the America's Cup, because this was the first time that flying hydrofoils were used in the America's Cup. And they, it really sort of um, kicked off a renaissance in hydrofoils in general. Until the America's Cup, hydrofoils had sort of been the province of, uh, of the, the lone tinkerer. And there hadn't been uh, much in the way of a widespread adoption of hydrofoils in sailboats. The, the main exception, was the Moth class. This is an 11 foot dinghy that um, is an open class that allows considerable variation in the design of the boats. And they started experimenting with hydrofoils and were able to find a way to make them competitive with the non-foiling boats for the first time. And then hydrofoils really took off in the Moth class and, um, and the moths are, are pretty much 100% uh, hydrofoils uh, anymore. It's really kind of viewed as a hydrofoil class now. But for bigger boats and for wider adoption of hydrofoils, um, I think it was really the, the America's Cup that showed that, that it was possible on larger boats and sort of gave the high-tech imprimatur to hydrofoils. So for the 34th America's Cup, um, the, the potential clubs that were to participate all negotiated what kind of boat would be used and agreed on two boats for the uh, overall campaign. The AC-45, which is a 45 foot long catamaran, and the AC-72, a 72 foot long catamaran. The AC-72, uh, like I said, it was 72 feet long. It had a rigid wing sail, and it was to be the boat that was sailed in the America's Cup match itself. The AC-45 was a simpler boat uh, because Oracle Team USA was the only team at the time that had experience with multi-hulls in the America's Cup. And so uh, the AC-45 was a way for other teams to gain experience with catamarans. And, and, and also there was a series of regattas called the America's Cup World Series, which were raced in venues around the world. And it was much cheaper to do those regattas in the AC-45 than it was in the AC-72s. So <clears throat> that was basically the, the genesis of the AC-45. The AC-45s were all one design boats. Uh, they were designed by Oracle Team USA 
at the beginning of the campaign and uh, built by core builders in New Zealand for all of the teams. The AC72 design rule was over 30 pages long and basically put constraints on the things that you could do to design the boat and still be considered an AC72. For the hulls, it was largely a box rule that set limits on the, the length and, and the beam of the boat. Uh, and as you can see in this diagram, there were certain restrictions on, on the cockpit area and so forth, but, but there was considerable freedom in the design of the hulls. For the wing sail, it had to fit within the shaded area on the, the diagram on the left. And there's a certain amount of wing area. Uh, and, but within that, the design was largely free as well. Um, the only constraint on the cross section of the wing was as shown in the bottom right corner, uh, a restriction on the, the girth of the, the, um, uh, the section as the, the flap was changed. So this tended to limit the, the complexity that you could have in the, uh, in the wing sail that you couldn't have a fowler flap, for example, that extended out as it was deflected. In addition to the boat technology, there's a lot of technology developed for the 34th America's Cup in the running of the event itself. Stan Honey and uh, his company developed the Liveline graphics. They were the ones that came up with the, the yellow first down line that you see on the NFL football broadcast. This is applied by a computer in real time to the TV image. Well, they, that is done with fixed cameras at the stadium. But for the America's Cup, they developed a way to do this from cameras that were flying around on helicopters which was an amazing feat because they needed to know where the camera was and where it was pointed to a very high degree of accuracy. So each boat also carried GPS that gave the boat's position to an accuracy of about two centimeters, about an inch. And so uh, these GPS data were transmitted back to the the uh, race headquarters where umpires watched the race on TV screen or on computer screens. So they could do a much better and more accurate job of umpiring the race from the data than, than they could uh, for traditional means. There was also uh, a couple of umpire boats on the water with un, uh, water umpires that could get a view from different angles that uh, and, and see things that the, weren't captured by the data. Well, this is a big advance for the, the public to view the racing because for the first time, they, you could put things on the image that would help people to really understand sailing. Like, for example, uh, the distance made good to windward or leeward across the course, so you could easily see who was actually leading when the boats were, were not close to each other. Another first for this was the live line allowed for uh, virtual boundaries to the race course. Sailing had never really had boundaries before. The boats could pretty much sail wherever they wanted, but now there, there were boundaries just like any other sporting event. And this confined the, the racing to be near the shore where uh, crowds could actually view it and hear it. And the sailors could hear the crowds cheering. And if the boat went outside the boundary, then it incurred a penalty uh, to slow down uh, and drop back a certain distance uh, and then resume sailing. So the event started off with training in the AC-45s in San Francisco. So our team was learning to sail these boats just like all the others. And we had our first capsize in San Francisco. Uh, the person you see uh, falling straight through the wing on this was our CEO, Russell Coots, who was helming the boat at the time. So I mentioned the World Series regatta. They were held in Cascai, Portugal, Plymouth, England, San Diego, USA, Newport, Naples, Italy, Venice, Italy, and San Francisco. 
And these were a huge success. Thousands of people watched the, the uh, racing in, in, uh, in person. And it was a, a big hit with the sailors too, because they could actually hear the crowds cheering for them, something that sailors never get to do otherwise. And um, it also allowed the, the race management and the teams to, uh, to learn the, sort of the new way of sailing these. Most sailboat regattas start, or sailboat races, excuse me, start with the boats sailing upwind across the starting line. Whereas uh, for these boats, what they adopted was a reaching start where they start going very fast across the wind, uh, round a mark and then head downwind. Uh, to another mark before heading upwind again. Now, while this was going on, uh, New Zealand was experimenting with foiling. Uh, first uh, with some small boats that they towed on a lake and then with a, uh, uh, I believe a, a 20 foot catamaran. And uh, Oracle Team USA got wind that they were doing these experiments and uh, started a crash course with AC-45s to learn how to foil themselves. And it was in this process that we discovered that mechanism for heat stability that, uh, that I mentioned earlier. I remember at one early meeting of the design of the AC-72, uh, Michelle Kermarek, our foil designer, put up a, a chart and this chart showed the performance as a function of how much of the boat's weight was carried by the foils versus how much by buoyancy with the hulls. And the x-axis was true wind speed and the y-axis was the uh, lift fraction from the foils. And then there were contours of constant performance. And there was a sweet spot kind of down towards the bottom left corner where uh, partial support of the, the boat with foils uh, improved the performance. And then there is also uh, up in the upper right-hand corner, a huge performance gain, like 40 boat lengths around the course. Yeah. And, uh, but that wasn't where we had started off the design with the AC-72 and we asked Michelle why why not go there? And he said, well, that's when the boat is fully flying and it's lifted completely out of the water. And we thought, oh, well, we can't do that because we can't stabilize the boat. But when we heard about New Zealand's experiments in foiling, we realized that maybe it was possible to sta stabilize the boat. And if so, we better learn how. And so that's what we did with the AC-45s. And at first, there are a lot of crashes and, you know, just foiling for 10 seconds was a big advance for us. And then it became uh, a minute and then we could start uh, foiling uh, continuously. Now, while this was going on, Luna Rosa was also experimenting with the same kind of catamarans as New Zealand. So all three teams were learning how to foil in smaller scale boats and then using that experience to design their AC-72s. And while the design work was going on, we were already building the boats. So there was a lot of activity at our base in San Francisco. The, um, it was required that the, that the hulls be built in the country of origin of the, of the club that was competing for the America's Cup. So we had set up a, a boat building operation in a warehouse on the San Francisco waterfront. In the upper left corner, which you see are molds that have been uh, sent up to Sandra Woolley in Washington state near the Canadian border to be machined. And then, then they came back down to San Francisco where they were used to actually create the hulls. Uh, and the other pictures just show various uh, operations in the creation of the AC-72s. So finally in August of 2012, we had our first AC-72 built and launched. It was named uh, 17. And so it was initially uh, launched without the wing sail on it. And then uh, a few days later, we made it with the wing sail and went sailing for the first time. 
So uh, the the way that we uh, uh, launched this boat was it was wheeled out of the shed, and then the wing sail was lifted up with a crane and lowered onto the the boat. And if you look in the upper left corner, you'll see an aluminum box at the bottom of the wing sail. Uh, that box was a water tank. And what it did was it, it ballasted the wing so that it would be uh, stable while dangling from the crane. Uh, otherwise, uh, when the wind blew, it could start to, to um, uh, kind of fly around on its own and, and be very dangerous. So that was, um, so that stabilized the, the wing sail until it was on the boat and the, um, uh, and the uh, shrouds were all attached. And then the water was drained out of the tank and it was removed. And so that's what you see in the bottom left corner is that tank uh, being removed from the boat. And then we had to send a guy up uh, all the way to the top of the wing sail to attach the wind instruments because um, the lines in the crane would have damaged the instruments had they been in place when we were uh, lifting the wing up. So once the, the wing was all in place, then he went up, uh, attached the wing instruments and detached the, the uh, cable from the crane and the boat was uh, then ready to sail. So we went out sailing for our first uh, sail and this is how it came back. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we broke the, one of the, the uh, dagger boards. Uh, this turned out to be a, a manufacturing problem. The uh, skin of the dagger board came unbonded from the core. Um, so uh, uh, not, not a lot of success on our first sail and of course, then the other board was immediately suspect as well. Uh, did it have the same problem that the first one did? But the, the big problem was uh, these were our only dagger boards at the time. It takes several months to build a set of dagger boards. And the second set was um, in construction, but not ready to be, go sailing yet. Now, no matter how much money you have, there's one thing that you cannot buy in an America's Cup campaign, and that is time. The event is gonna happen at the scheduled day, and if you're not ready, then you forfeit. So, uh, so this was a, a big setback for us. But what we did was we took a, a dagger board from that 90 foot trimaran, and we cut it up and machined it and created L-foils out of it. And that's how we got sailing uh, about a month later um, with these uh, uh, sort of makeshift uh, L foils. Uh, unfortunately, in the, the uh, protocol for the event, you could only build so many sets of, of dagger boards. And so uh, this also used up one of our allowed sets. And then in October, uh, we were out sailing and the wind was rising and um, they basically finished their testing and it was time to turn around and head back to the base. And when they did, uh, the, the boat pitch poled and this happened to be the strongest ebb tide of the year. And the boat was being carried out to sea uh, faster than the chase boats could tow it back in. It got swept out through the Golden Gate and into an area that they call the Potato Patch, which is a notoriously rough area just outside uh, San Francisco Bay. And there um, the, uh, the wing collapsed, the hull fell on top of it and basically uh, pulverized it and severely damaged the boat. So um, this was really a major setback. It was like three in the morning after the tide had changed before we were able to, to get the capsized boat towed back to our base. So it wasn't until the 4th of February uh, 2013 that we were finally able to get back sailing again. So we lost a lot of testing time uh, with that accident. 
and, but it had the, the side effect of, of substantially improving the safety of all the boats. So when we got back say we made a number of design changes um, and all the teams incorporated things like airbags in the top of the wing so that should the boat capsize again, uh, they would be deployed and uh, help support the boat and, and keep it from collapsing the way that, that ours did. So we were out sailing and of course, uh, course our friends are out watching us too. You can see the, the New Zealand uh, spy boat and the Artemis spy boat down there by uh, uh, Alcatraz Island as, as we were out uh, sailing our boat. And then in April, we had our second boat launched. And this is to be the, uh, the actual race boat. Two boat testing is the norm in sailing because it's very difficult to accurately measure the performance and to see the difference in small changes in the design or in how you're sailing the boat. Um, the conditions from day to day for a sailboat are so different that uh, it's, it's very difficult to compare results directly from one day to the next. So what you do is you sail two nearly identical boats side by side. Uh, so they're far enough apart that they're not interfering with each other, but they're close enough that they're in the same conditions. And you make a change to one boat and you see if that improves or, or degrades the performance relative to the other boat. And in this manner, you can make a number of small changes and see what the effects are and uh, develop the performance of the boat. So here we are at sailing boat two, and you notice these, these dagger boards look a little bit different than the previous ones. We had different dagger boards for light winds and for heavy winds. And while this is going on, uh, there's, uh, the boat shop is not empty. Um, you do not build a boat for the America's Cup and go out and race it and, uh, and be done. You build a boat, you test it, you redesign, you hack it to bits, you rebuild it, you test it, you redesign, hack it to bits and rebuild it. And this process goes on continuously right up through the regatta itself. Um, so the, the, the boat building team and the shore team are, are never out of work in an America's Cup campaign. So to give you an idea, uh, we needed to change the buoyancy of the bow for uh, boat one. And so we literally cut off the, the, uh, the bottom of the hull, as you can see on the upper left corner there, and inserted some small wedges and put it back on. Um, the third picture from the left on the top is one of the dagger boards being tested in a, a test rig. We used hydraulics to apply loads that were similar to those uh, sailing so that we could um, ensure that the, the foil had the right structural integrity and the stiffness uh, so that we, we didn't get surprised with a, a breakage like we did on our first sail. On the bottom left, you can see one of the wings that we experimented with for the uh, stern foil. And um, on the bottom right, is the mechanism that was used inside the wing sail to control the flaps. Um, you can almost think of this as a hydromechanical computer that um, had a very, implemented a very simple equation um, that the upper flap deflection was uh, a multiple of the bottom flap deflection. However, that multiple could be changed by the sailors uh, as they were sailing. And, uh, and by this way, we could change the twist of the flaps um, up the wing sail. The flaps could be twisted as much as 40 degrees from bottom to top. Um, but it was, a, it was a, as you can see, a very uh, complex uh, mechanism that controlled the wing. And then not long before the regatta was to start, um, tragedy struck the America's Cup. Uh, Artemis was out sailing their AC-72 and the main beam collapsed. The boat 
uh, capsized and um, a sailor was trapped between the boat and the wing and drowned. Um, so uh, that basically put a stop to all the sailing uh, while the teams uh, considered what to do to improve the safety of the event and of the boats. But by June, we were back sailing again. So here we're back doing that two boat testing that I mentioned uh, and also uh, uh, training our race tactics and sailing against each other on San Francisco Bay. And then finally in July, it was time to, uh, to start the racing itself. So it started off with racing between the challengers um, to select which team would meet uh, Oracle Team USA as, uh, as the official challenger in the America's Cup event itself. Uh, during this time, uh, the uh, AC45s were being prepared for the Youth America's Cup uh, racing. And they discovered some irregularities in the way that Oracle Team USA had, had prepared their AC45s. And so uh, Oracle Team USA was assessed a two point penalty for the America's Cup. And as a result, what was to be a, a best of 17 race series turned out to be the first team to get to nine points and Oracle Team USA started off with a negative two point score. So we had to win two races just to get to zero. Um, and, uh, and, and that was a, you know, a, a major uh, uh, penalty for, for us relative to Team New Zealand. So when we started, we expected to be faster than New Zealand upwind and uh, hold with New Zealand downwind. And instead, New Zealand turned out to be faster upwind than us. Um, and so we lost um, uh, four out of the first five races. So things were not going well. And in the protocol, there was a provision for a team to postpone a race. Um, we were racing two races a day, um, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And uh, the, um, the postponement provision was uh, in case, for example, there was a breakdown of the boat in the first race of the day, then you would almost certainly lose the second race because of the breakdown because you hadn't had a chance to fix it. <clears throat> so because of that, each team could postpone uh, a race for any reason. Uh, but they could only do that once during the entire regatta. So after we lost race five, we decided that uh, we needed to, some time to, to figure out what was going wrong. And uh, we elected to uh, play our, our postponement card. So at the, uh, um, at, at the press conference afterwards, uh, Someone asked uh, uh, Jimmy Spithill, our skipper, if he was in danger of losing his job. And his, his comment was, well, you can be a rooster one day and a feather duster the next. <laughs> and, and which kind of uh, summed things up pretty well, I thought. So the next day after, uh, after we did the postponement was a lay day. And that gave us a chance to make some changes when, when we did the postponement, we had a meeting back at the base with all of the sailors and all of the designers and a lot of the boat builders. And if you've seen the movie Apollo 13, where the engineers get together and they put everything on the table that the astronauts have on board the capsule to fix the problem, uh, that was very much what this meeting was like. Um, Everybody was there and we were putting all the ideas on the table that we could come up with to improve the speed of the boat. Um, absolutely nothing was uh, too outlandish to consider. We even thought about moving the main bulkhead of the, uh, of the, uh, the hull uh, in order to uh, improve the lateral balance of the boat but we decided that we just didn't have enough time 
uh, to get that done. But we made a number of changes, including how we tune the wing sail. We opened the slot between the flap and the main element, and we changed the profile of the twist of the flaps going up in order to uh, improve the, the balance of the boat. Um, our boat had a lee helm, which means that going upwind, it wanted to turn away from the wind instead of up into the wind. And this has to be countered with a rudder and there's a performance penalty for that. And so we needed to shift the uh, center of effort of the wing aft and opening the slot did that. It decreased the load on the main element, increased the load on the flap and that and some other changes, we, we nearly doubled the load on the wing sheet which uh, showed just how far we were able to move the center of effort of the wing. And, and that was turned out to be quite effective in, uh, in improving and improving our upwind speed. So uh, next one, uh, next couple of races, we still lost, but we were doing much better. We, um, we were closer than New Zealand and, uh, and after uh, race seven, a reporter at the press conference uh, asked uh, Jimmy Spithell what his motivation was uh, for uh, continuing going because uh, Team USA seemed to be so far behind and, and New Zealand uh, was only a few points away from winning this event. And uh, Jimmy's statement turned out to be very prophetic. He said, imagine if these guys lost from here, what upset that would be. They've almost got it in the bag and that's my motivation. And nobody at that time uh, thought that Team USA could win this event. And, and they thought that uh, uh, Jimmy was just kind of blowing smoke with that statement. But on race eight, uh, uh, Oracle Team USA had, uh, uh, well, had improved their speed to the point where uh, when they had a crossing that uh, Emirates who were on port were surprised that Oracle was there and they had to make a crash tack. When they did, um, they kind of lost control of their wing sail momentarily and the boat uh, nearly capsized. Um, you, you got to give a lot of credit for to the uh, New Zealand sailors, though, because their wing had to be hydraulically controlled all the time. And these guys kept uh, cranking and driving those hydraulics to control the wing, even through this massive uh, upset that they went through. Well, they managed to just bring it back. Uh, and uh, but Team USA went on to win that. So we had finally worked off our penalty and we're now back at scratch uh, after having lost uh, six races to New Zealand. Race 13, which would have been the final race had New Zealand won, uh, ended up being abandoned uh, because of uh, the winds were so light that Team New Zealand could not finish within the time limit. So then race 13 had to be uh, resailed and uh, Oracle Team USA won that resale of race 13. As they did all of the subsequent races. So again and again, uh, Team USA managed to, to pull it out and, uh, and draw until they were finally tied with New Zealand. On uh, race 18, uh, Oracle Team USA demonstrated something that both teams had experimented with but had never mastered and that was foiling upwind. Uh, these boats typically sail in one hull upwind although they could fly downwind but uh, Oracle Team USA uh, found that they could in fact fly both hulls out of the water upwind with great effort on the part of the crew and, uh, and use this uh, strategically to, um, to pass New Zealand. So that was really uh, a major turning point in the race was uh, being able to foil upwind. Race 19, 
now it was tied up, uh, everything was on the line. Uh, the, um, the center picture shows the Emeritus Cup sitting on its pedestal in the middle of the warehouse that was the Team USA base. The cup was out there every morning um, before the, uh, the boat left. And it was just kind of sitting there all by itself. There, there was a guard uh, nearby, but he wasn't uh, immediately close to the cup. And it almost seems to give two messages. Either get your picture with a cup now because it won't be here tomorrow. Or when you go out today, remember this is what you're fighting for. And um, it, it, was, it was really amazing spirit on the part of the entire team, uh, you know, being behind so desperately and, and coming back, there was never any recriminations or accusations within the team that the whole team spirit was, was very positive and everybody was just doing everything they could to make this a success. Um, and Team USA ended up winning race 19 with a similar kind of pass that they did in the previous race. And the comeback was complete. We had successfully defended the America's Cup. It was one of the greatest comebacks in, in sports history. So that's what I have for my talk. And I'll now entertain um, any questions that you might have. Who is first? Mark. Thanks. Uh, amazing presentation, Tom. I, wa I watched some of the, the races and to see that comeback was, was just awe-inspiring. I seem to recall that, you know, one of the ingredients that went into the, to the comeback was there was increase uh, and it was somebody on a team who was an expert on currents in San Francisco Bay and, you know. You're thinking of John Kostecki. Yeah, yeah. And so he was our, he was our tactician at first. Yeah. And then, and then um, uh, 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 Ben Ainsley, British sailor, took over. Ben Ainsley had been our uh, skipper for boat one and uh, sort of our, our uh, um, I don't know, opposing team skipper, you might say. And so he took over as the, um, as the tactician. But John was still very much involved. He was still uh you know helping and critiquing and observing what's going on and uh very much contributing to to the racing even though he was on shore i think that was a good example of the team spirit that we had um that you know he didn't take it personally that he was replaced by ben ainsley as tactician thank you what's next martin you must have something Certainly do, Tom. Uh, plenty of uh, plenty of technical questions uh, raised by your presentation, so thanks for that. And I really enjoy that comeback. It's one of those uh, world uh, sporting comebacks that are memorable. Um, Tom, the, the one that uh, has cropped up in a quite separate discussion in the last couple of days, uh, the, the latest America's Cup boats, they're now monohulls, but uh, at least one of the teams got a quite a quirky looking skeg or keel on the right. bottom of the hull. I don't know if you've been monitoring it, but it yes. actually comes back to something I was intrigued by. And that is unlike uh, normal displacement monohull sailboats, um, that, that the sea surface effectively acts like a mirror plane or a ground board for the right. sail. Um, and you have therefore higher efficiency on these hydrofoil boats. Once the, the 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 craft lifts out of the water, you've basically got a gap between the sea surface and the the boat right. and uh, and the sail, and so your aspect ratio of your uh, sail has effectively gone down. Do, do you guys account for all that um, effect in all of your modelling and try oh, and absolutely. deal with it? And, and and that was one of the reasons that our boat was proved faster than the New Zealand boat was we had basically a centre body that extended down in just that manner, uh, whereas they did not. And um, so yes, the effective span of our wing sail was greater than theirs. And, and right. that was one of the reasons we expected to be faster upwind. It turned out that what they had done is they had mastered um, sort of the rolling tack or the foil assisted tack upwind, uh, 
we were attacking by starting off on one hull, flopping down on the two hulls as we made the turn and then picking up on the other hull. Whereas what they did is they used their hydrofoils to very quickly flip from one hull to the other as they made their turn. And so they, they spent very little time with both hulls in the water and that allowed them to turn quicker and lose less speed in the tacks. And so we basically had to learn that same technique during the racing because um, we had only just mastered the foiling jibe before the uh, regatta started. Got it. Thank you. Tom, I'm always expected to have a question, but I, I am for one of the few times in my life speechless presentations I've ever seen. Um, being both a pilot and a hydrofoiler, um, I, I never cared to be without an engine uh, because if I couldn't hear an engine, I knew something was very wrong. So I, I, I was rated in everything except gliders and, uh, and uh, always hydroplanes, not, nothing of this sort. Right. Uh, but I'll tell you, you made it very exciting. And I always yeah, thought you. that sailing would not be nearly that exciting, but uh, you have me on the edge of my seat, and I thank you so much. I don't know how we missed each other at, at Boeing. I assume it's because you're so much younger than I am. Probably. Uh, I hope well, I didn't go to Boeing until 96. So well, I was out of Boeing in uh, 70, in 69 right, right. or 71. Uh, did you know Brian Lyle? Uh, I, I did not. But you know, sailing as a spectator sport traditionally has ranked second only to correspondence chess. And um, hey, you know, it's been hey. described as uh, two white triangles on a blue background. <laughs> but um, but uh, with, the, with the combination of these truly high performance boats and sailing short courses next to the shore, uh, we've really made sailing an exciting spectator sport uh, between um, the, the 34th and 35th uh, America's Cup regattas and, and what they've done for the World Series regattas. So I think that has changed the nature of the America's Cup forever. So I, I think the last three campaigns, uh, all in, in multi-hulls or hydrofoils, um, it, it really changed the direction, not just of the America's Cup, but of sailing in general. The other thing that amazed me about your presentation was the, it was, I think, Bill's introduction. I had no idea that you could be both an aeronautical expert and a, a hydrodynamic expert. Um, when I went to Stanford, started in 58, they had neither course. There was no aeronautical engineering. There was no hydrodynamic engineering, nothing of the sort. Uh, and it was, uh, there, there were a couple of professors in civil engineering and mechanical, as I recall, that shared my interest and taught me much of what I learned until I uh, went back to Boeing uh, in between my junior and senior years at Stanford. Um, but but I, I, just, I just loved everything you said and everything you did. Uh, and the, the pictures that you chose and your descriptions. So not only was it a competitive uh, saga, uh, but, but it was an engineering marvel. And, and I, I just, I'm sure everybody feels the same way. Thank you so much for Thank everything you. you've done for Hydrofoils and everything you did today for our IHS at 50 program. Fantastic, standing ovation if we could stand. <laughs> Ray, I think, except you're mute, Ray. Ray, you're muted. Ray, you're mute. You're still muted, Ray. Well, that's a blessing, Bill. Let's not mention it again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Ray, you're Ray, muted. muted. Yeah, that, Ray, so you've got to unmute. Right. There you go. OK. Uh, you're you're unmute. Says, Everything uh, you said was, was very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the question is, what is coming up with the America's Cup? What's next? Well, how are they going to change the boats? And well, okay, I'm not involved with the current campaign, but uh, basically what the Team New Zealand and, and Luna Rosa have agreed on is, a, is yet another uh, new class for the America's Cup called the AC-75. And these are monohulls that uh, fly on hydrofoils. So they have basically a T-foil on a curved arm on each side of the boat and a, uh, a, a central rudder at, with a T-foil. And unlike the AC-72s and AC-50s, 
This time, they're controlling the foils with flaps instead of raking the entire foil. Um, the design rule for the AC-72s and AC-50s uh, forbade having moving parts on the foil itself. And, uh, but in, in this case, what they're doing is uh, they, they basically have these arms and, uh, and the arms are actually supplied equipment. So they are making the arms, uh, not just as one design, but they're all coming from the same supplier to all of the teams. And, uh, and then the teams make their own foils to go on the bottoms of the arms. So this way they ensure that these uh, very high stress structural parts um, are adequate for everybody. Because as we discovered, um, the, uh, you know, not all, all the teams uh, were equally competent in, in making structures uh, for multi health. Um, and uh, so anyway, they're, they're controlling these with flaps. And uh, there's, a, there's sort of a box that the foil has to fit within. So some have been experimenting with T foils and some that look like inverted Y foils. Uh, the uh, British team has come up with one that's sort of a cranked Y. Um, it, it, it descends like it's a Y foil and then they have a bend in the middle of each wing that flattens out in order to stay within the box, uh, which of course greatly complicates the flap design when you have to segment the flaps that way. Um, and the hull shapes are largely open for this class. Um, and so you're seeing a, a lot of variation. Uh, a couple of teams started off with sort of scow hull type uh, hulls. And, and now they're all going to something that has some sort of a, a center skag and, and, and the bridge boat has a, a bit of a bustle. Um, and because the, the problem is with these boats is when you're starting out and you're hull borne, you don't have very much stability. Uh, and unlike the catamaran, which has its maximum stability when it's uh, sitting on its, its, its hulls. And so when you, you, you have to very carefully accelerate, if you sheet in too much, the boat will capsize. And so uh, you, you, you have to sheet in and accelerate gradually. And the faster you go, then the more effective the foils become and the more you can stabilize the boat with the foils, which means you can sheet in more and then that goes faster and that stabilizes more of the foils. So there's this process that you have to go through in order to accelerate up speed on these boats. And so initially some of the teams thought that they needed a wide flat hull to get as much stability as possible in this initial phase but then that proved to be not quite as fast once they were foiling, because as you've mentioned, there's a bigger gap between the hull and the water. And so, so now they're, they're going with these center skags that acted just like the center body on our AC-72 in order to extend that effective span of the wing sail. And how about the control systems? Are, uh, is there anything about energy storage and uh, how do, is there anything about using automatic control systems or, or do, does the uh, person in charge sight off into the horizon to, to change the pitch and, and what does he do to, does he just- Right, so, okay, so um, on the AC-72, there was no stored energy allowed. For the AC-50, they allowed hydraulic accumulators on the supply side of a limited size. Um, and this made a huge difference in, in safety of the boat and, and being able to sail through maneuvers, but they were otherwise entirely manually powered. The AC-75s have an electrically driven hydraulic system for controlling the foils. The controller that raises and lowers the arms is supplied by, uh, by New Zealand. And they cannot make any changes to the software of that controller. Um, but they can do their own control of the flaps. Now, they can't do an automated system where they have a feedback sensing of, say, the flying height to the foils. Um, but, but they are uh, hydraulically driven and electrically powered. 
Um, and then they're using more manual power for the control of the wing sail itself. Um, or actually, they don't really have a wing sail as we did. They have a, a double surface soft sail with a rotating mast. So they have a D-shaped mast and then basically two mainsails uh, back to back that come off of that mast. And so that's controlled in a, in a more traditional way. Um, so they still have grinders, but they also have stored energy uh, for the foils. And has anybody thought about using the leg power of the grinders rather than using the upper body strength? Yes, that's been ruled out for the AC-75s. We Good looked question. at that for our AC-50s and um, we did some tests and, and we considered leg power. But what we found was that because our grinders had trained all their lives to strengthen their arms uh, rather than their legs, that while they, they could produce a little bit more power with their legs, uh, it wasn't as dramatic as you might think. Whereas um, we were concerned about uh, the ability to, to get uh, from one hall to the other and get seated again every time you tacked or jived. Remember these, these boats were doing maneuver every couple of minutes. And um, so we, we weren't sure whether we would lose out on that. And that's why we elected to go with arm power for our boat. Uh, New Zealand uh, obviously chose uh, for the AC-50s to go with leg power. And they basically uh, trained as cyclists uh, in order to, to do that. Uh, just one more small question related. Uh, but when they when the grinders work, are they running uh, electrical generators, and then this power is stored in batteries, or how does that work? No, I think uh, I think for the AC forty uh, AC seventy fives, um, I think they're driving winches for the main sheets, and I'm not sure what else. I think they they. I'm not sure on the hydraulics what what, their, what the design rule calls for in terms of control of the wing. There may be other questions, but I'd like to say, Tom, this has been one of the best presentations we've had so far. Outstanding. Thank you. Right. Yeah, Martin, yeah. we are um, we're a bit over time, so uh, how about a quick one? Well, Tom, you just uh, you mentioned about sailing two boats side by side on the same day to test different um, setups and uh, technical features of boat. But how do you then correct for the fact that the two crews are operating the two boats slightly different? So almost as much variation due to the crews than the, the technical features. Any comment? Um, no, that's part of the variability. Um, you know, you, you try to uh, um, get the crews, you know, the, you, 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 there's actually a playbook um, for how these boats are sailed, who does what and maneuvers and so forth. And most of the two boat testing is, is, is steady state straight line sailing. Um, there's, you know, for now for maneuvers, you're, you know, you do your, your sort of uh, race training. Um, but for the real performance testing, it's, it's pretty much just sailing in a straight line. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Excellent presentation. I'm glad